You lay your quill down beside the scroll of parchment, stretching your hand against a developing cramp. Picking up the parchment, you blow gently on the still wet ink to speed its drying. When it's sufficiently dry, you roll the parchment up tightly, fasten a piece of twine in a knot around it, and tie the scroll to the leg of your patient and inquisitive raven, Nora. She does not take off straight away, but waits on the ledge, her head cocked at an angle and black eyes shining. You roll your eyes, relenting, and fetch a handful of crushed walnuts from your bag. Nora nibbles at them contentedly, then affectionately nips at your hand before taking wing. You watch her go, the scroll of parchment secure against her leg, her wing beats fluid, black against a still, slate-gray sky. You watch her in flight, your loyal bird, and imagine what it might be like to soar so. You've ridden a flying broomstick before, a liberating experience, but still you envy the birds, their wings. She's carrying a letter to a loved one back home. With luck, she'll return in a day or two with a response. You're no stranger to being away from home, this not being your first year at boarding school after all. But at the moment, you've been feeling somewhat homesick. With Nora well out of sight, you take a deep breath of the frosty air from the window and turn to leave the rookery. A few of the other ravens croak to acknowledge your leaving. Down the spiral stairs, you wind toward the sixth-floor corridor, your book bag slung over your shoulder. You're glad you had time to sneak up to the tower before class, though carrying around the prolific stack of books has proven burdensome. You stroll through the Hall of Tapestries, in an oft-abandoned corridor of the school during this part of term. The hangings on either wall depict scenes in the life of the founder of the school of sorcery, the great wizard, Merlin. There's a vivid tapestry you pass now, which illustrates the young Merlin's prophecy at the court of King Vortigern, who could not successfully build a castle as every stone he laid came tumbling down. Merlin spoke through his gift of the sight of two great dragons who battled in a lake beneath the earth, one red, one white. Their struggle beneath that very ground was the reason the castle could not stand. The tapestry depicts a crumbling stone tower beneath which the dragon's conflict rages, each beast threatening to break through the ground and swallow the tower whole. The best part about the tapestries, they're sewn with enchanted thread, which breathes with enchanted life. The pictures woven through them move bringing into exquisite relief the action and energy of the stories. You dally for just a moment, watching the red and white dragon vie for victory. Their tails, long and serpentine, twist round each other, entwining here and there like the tangled roots of an ancient tree, their claws and teeth bared. Though they're creatures of wrath and fire, you can't help but find them graceful, beautiful even. And then there's the quiet shifting of the thread itself, moving like waves on the ocean, colors blending and unfurling, gold 
and white and red and black. On you go past the other tapestries. One portrays Merlin, bearded and fierce-looking, directing the construction of Stonehenge in the summer country. In another, the wizard withers between the enclosing brambles of a hawthorn bush as Nimue, Lady of the Lake, looks on in triumph. But you can't tarry long. Class is starting soon. And indeed, only moments after leaving the Hall of Tapestries, as you bound up the stairs of the West Tower, taking the stone steps two at a time, the hourly bells begin to chime. The bells clang and clamor, resonating deeply throughout the belly of the castle. It occurs to you now that you've never, in all these years, exploring the school and its grounds, discovered where those clanging bells reside. But by the time the echoes ring, vibrating silently in the bones of the stones, you're stepping into the classroom, and you've forgotten that curiosity once again. The professor isn't anywhere to be seen yet. Good, you think, that you weren't seen striding in a few moments late. The classroom, usually sunny, with all its westerly windows, is grayish in the grim weather of late. A shuffle of books and papers all around you, mutterings of half-finished conversations as you and your classmates settle into your seats. You always liked this classroom, with its large, pointed windows and gothic furnishings. Usually it's here that you report for magical history class, and it's outfitted accordingly, with shelf after shelf of thick, dusty volumes and busts of famous witches and wizards of the ages. But this term, you're taking a special elective, only offered when there is enough interest from students at advanced sorcery levels. Intro to Alchemy From the very first lesson, it was apparent that Professor Lovage, the school's long-serving history teacher, is uniquely knowledgeable and passionate about the subject. You can feel the enthusiasm dripping from every word, every gesture the teacher makes. But thus far, most of the study has been purely historical, an overview of alchemical tradition from around the world, Egypt, ancient Greece, medieval Europe, China, and so on. It's interesting, sure, but it's not quite what you expected. When will we start transmuting metals to gold, you and your classmates have whispered. When will we get a crack at mixing the elixir of life, the philosopher's stone? All in due time, the professor's sly smile seems to assure you. You're quite excited about today's lesson, actually, because Professor Lovage hinted that you might start to conduct your own experiments at last, and that there was something of a surprise in store for the class today. Already you're encouraged, for each student's desk is laden with an array of objects, a small iron cauldron, three small bottles of powder and liquid, and a feather. From what you can see, and everyone is glancing around the room comparing objects, there are a few different feathers about. Yours is black, resembling a raven's feather, 
like Nora's. But there are white feathers at some desks, too, like that of a swan. Even peacock tail feathers, iridescent cobalt, green and black. There's some speculation among you as to the significance of the different feathers. But now the classroom whispers have grown to full-voiced questioning. Where is Professor Lovage, the ever-punctual Professor Lovage? All the teachers at the School of Sorcery reside within the castle during term, so it's not as if anyone has far to travel between classes. The mutterings fall silent, however, when the heavy door of the classroom groans open. Professor Lovage appears in silhouette within the doorframe, wrapped in a cloak and carrying something large and cumbersome. It's difficult at first to see what it is, but as the professor moves down the aisle between desks, you discern that it's, well, a birdcage, it seems, covered by a shroud of purple velvet. Professor Lovage sets the covered cage upon the table at the head of the classroom, lights the candelabra there with a wand flourish, takes a big, enthusiastic inhale, and welcomes the class, as if there were nothing at all unusual about this entrance. Salt, says Professor Lovage, grasping and holding aloft a vial of white, crystalline powder from a desk at the front of the classroom. The word emerges with such finality and confidence that you find yourself looking about the classroom to gauge the responses of others. Has the lesson begun? Is it a question to be answered? Is the professor expecting a response? But a moment later, sulfur. The professor puts down the vial of salt and picks up another glass bottle on the desk opposite this one filled with a powdery substance of a pale yellow. Mercury. Another bottle held aloft, this one made of a thick glass and containing a viscous, silvery liquid. These are the building blocks, the prime essences of the alchemical pursuit, the tria prima, the professor continues. You lean forward in your chair, twirling the stem of the black feather between your two fingers. Salt, Lovage says, represents the base matters of the world. Crystallization, condensation, force, and the physical. The element of earth the body. Mercury, this volatile substance, not quite liquid nor solid, represents the mind, the space between states, the connective fluid. Tied to the element of air, it bridges states of matter, and it bridges this world and the next. Sulfur, agent of fire, of the spirit, the soul. This transcendent element in balance with mercury is, at least in the minds of alchemists like Paracelsus, the prime material of all other metals. If that's so, it stands to reason, the professor continues, that adjusting the ratio of sulfur in any metal, lead, for instance, could eventually produce gold. But the principles were applied to medicine, too. 
You gently, absent-mindedly tap the lids of the three glass bottles on your desk as you listen. Salt, the body. Mercury, the mind. Sulfur, the soul. You'll remember from the very first lesson, our guiding principle as alchemists, Lovage says, leaving the statement open with an expectant smile. A whisper snakes through the classroom as, with varying degrees of confidence, each of you utters the simple recitation, as above, so below. That which is above is like that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above, the professor nods. The rotations and revolutions of the stars and planets in their celestial abode, the movement of us animals on the surface of the earth, the tiny atoms and molecules arranging and rearranging in the unseen world, that which is within and that which is without. The professor is waxing lyrical and cryptic again. This happens from time to time when discussing the opaque history of alchemy. Talk of the cosmos and unknowable forces that govern the very large and the very small. Your eyes linger lazily to the covered cage sitting on the professor's desk, unremarked upon. You wonder if others are as preoccupied with its presence as you are. According to Professor Lovage, It's in the history of the alchemical tradition that the origins of magic, as you know it, can be found. The pursuit of the secrets of creation, the universe and its workings. Once this manifold idea was seen as monolithic, a unified effort by alchemists the world over, But as the wheels of the modern world were set in motion, alchemy diverged. The mystics, magicians, and sorcerers retreated further into the shadows, creating from esoterica a library of spells, potions, and transmutations. They built schools for young witches and wizards, and hid from the rest of the world. But alchemy also lay the groundwork for natural philosophy and modern science, chemistry, medicine, the arts that live in the light. Alchemy, even when the name of the art was sullied by charlatans at medieval courts, produced great geniuses like Isaac Newton, whose revelation of nature's physical laws transformed the way humans think about the world. And how, the professor wonders, is that not magic in itself? It was Terry Pratchett, you recall, who said, It didn't stop being magic just because you found out how it was done. That always resonated with you. You imagine the history of alchemy as a dragon with its tail cloven in two, one side burrowing deep into the ground and the other reaching up into the heavens Yet each of the segments of the tail is so long in your mental picture that they spiral through the heavens and the underworld, returning to the surface of the earth 
so that the dragon might bite each end in its own mouth. The practice of magic is not so very unlike the pursuit of scientific discovery. And yet, the two have been artificially separated for much of human history. It's the appearance of two dragons battling beneath the foundations of civilization. But that's only an illusion. There's only one dragon. Professor Lovage instructs you to open your copies of the Annotated Hermetica, a vast compilation of texts attributed to the ancient alchemist Hermes Trismegistus, with chapters added by medieval writers. Your copy is second-hand at best, tattered and worn from years of use. But you rather like it that way. The faded marginalia and brittle-edged paper remind you of how truly old this information is, how many hands the text has changed, how many generations puzzled over its messages and obscure symbols. As you flip through the pages, you kick up the sense of history, sulfur, smoke, and a lingering sweetness. You search for the chapter in question on symbols associated with the magnum opus or great work, the Philosopher's Stone. This mysterious artifact which comes up frequently in discussion of alchemy, is said to be a compound, sometimes liquid, sometimes solid, or even vapor, capable of catalyzing the ultimate transformation. With this tool, the alchemist could transmute base metals into gold and could even produce the elusive elixir of life a solution that grants eternal life to the drinker. On the first page of the chapter, there's an illustration of an alchemist at work, bent over a wheelbarrow of an unidentified substance. Beside him is a large cauldron over an orange flame. Within the cauldron is a curious spectacle. A small dragon, fire spilling out of its mouth as it nips at its own tail. Sitting atop the dragon is a blue-black bird, wings spread. And sitting atop the head of that bird is another, smaller bird, this one pure black. Once again, you absent-mindedly touch the raven's feather upon your desk. The professor directs your attention to the following page, also richly illustrated with depictions of five birds. You scan the page from top to bottom, taking in the colors and detail. The raven, the white swan, the peacock, the pelican, the phoenix. Wheels are beginning to turn behind your eyes. These are the five birds of alchemy, Professor Lovage explains. Each of them unique corresponding to virtues and properties of the physical and spiritual realms. But each of them also represents a phase in the process of the great work, the making of the Philosopher's Stone. The professor reads now from the text with great embellishment and drama. 
Darkness will appear on the face of the abyss. Night, Saturn, and the antimony of the sages will appear. Blackness and the raven's head of the alchemists and all the colors of the world will appear at the hour of conjunction. The rainbow also and the peacock's tail. Finally, after the matter has passed from ashen colored to white and yellow, you will see the philosopher's stone. And then, one by one, the professor expounds on the significance of the five birds. The raven, blackness, the first stage in the process, the time to set intention and to release the physical world, preparing to step into the etheric world. The white swan, the first transformation, accompanied by bright light, the first step into the next world. The peacock, the turning point, the alchemist's moment of inner revelation. The pelican, distillation, and sacrifice. No alchemy, no magic, can be achieved without it, as the pelican illustrated here feeds her young. So you must give something of yourself to achieve the great work. And finally, the phoenix, the final transformation or completion the transfiguration not only of the substance, which should now gleam a deep and rubious red like the phoenix's feathers, but of the soul of the alchemist who has given of themselves to create something new. Much of this sounds familiar when it comes to the magic you've studied all these years at the school. Everything, as you learned in your magic fundamentals classes, begins with intention. The hardest part of attempting any spell or brewing any potion has nothing to do with the power of your wand or your stirring technique, and everything to do with clarifying the intention in your mind. But sacrifice... Until now, you've always seen magic as a tool, used it to heal minor illness and injury, complete household tasks, or perform in a duel. It's something you've practiced as a skill, learning the appropriate incantations, gestures, ingredients throughout your schooling. But there's something about the way Professor Lovage talks about the magical side of alchemy, as if it's not just a tool or a process of transposing materials, but a spiritual pursuit, a purification not only of metals and earthly substances, but of the soul. Well, you're simply captivated by it. You recall earlier this year at Halloween, during the school's annual celebration and carnival, the head teacher led the students and staff through a Samhain ritual to release the past. You were given a bundle of herbs representing where you are on your magical and personal journey. And you were invited to keep it, or to cast it into a bonfire, symbolizing a fresh start in the seasons ahead. Unlike the spells and charms you practice in your classes, 
This ritual didn't immediately produce a tangible result, but it left you with much to contemplate and a path to walk into the future. Is that what Professor Lovage means by giving of oneself, by sacrifice? Is this a gateway to some higher magic? an alchemy of the soul. You can feel yourself sliding into lyrical notions and cryptic thought. You suppose that's natural in these circumstances. Alchemy, you've learned, is the pursuit of revelation, the search for the high mysteries of the universe. The answers lie before us, locked in secret codes, natural hiding places, and the movements of stars. All we need is to find the key, the one, the pure. But now comes the time for experimentation. The professor directs your attention once more to the items you're equipped with. The three prime substances, salt, sulfur, mercury. The feather, which by now you should be able to identify as belonging to one of the five birds of alchemy. Using these items, conscious of their symbolism and of the principles of intention and sacrifice, each student is to conduct an alchemical experiment. And there endeth the instruction. You and your classmates look around at each other, expecting someone to raise a hand or blurt out a question. Is there no recipe? What are we supposed to make? These questions buzz through your mind, but never make it to your lips. For you implicitly understand that the lack of direction is the point. But the professor speaks, addressing the stunned silence of the class. Do I expect you to come up with a philosopher's stone by the end of class? Of course not. It's an introductory course, and most alchemists toil their whole lives long in pursuit of the magnum opus. This is an invitation to play, to inquire, to investigate, make something or make meaning. There are a few more moments of confused silence, then whispers and mutterings between classmates. The professor retreats behind the table at the head of the chamber to read from a nondescript volume. Still, no comment on the velvet-covered cage You don't join in any of the hushed conversations around you. You're eager to start on your experiment. Salt. Sulfur. Mercury. The three prime substances that, if you believe the alchemists, are all important to transformation and composition. Naturally, your first inclination is to experiment with the ratios of the three substances to produce a solution of some kind. Who knows what you'll produce? Certainly not gold, barring a miracle. But the point of the exercise is to simply try something, right? But as you reach for the bottle of salt, and begin to uncork it, something stops you. 
you set the vial down and line up all three small bottles. Then you look to the feather, then to your aged volume. You pull the book closer to you. Others around you are beginning to work uncorking bottles and exclaiming at the powerful odor of the sulfur powder. But there's something you remember from an earlier lesson, something that might be a guide in your process. You flip through the pages of the annotated Hermetica to a chapter on Paracelsus, a Renaissance alchemist, about whom Professor Lovage tends to drone on with admiration. His work contributed significantly to modern medicine, as well as prophecy and divination through alchemy. The professor considers him a bridge between the scientific and occult schools of alchemy the rejoined tale of the dragon, using the metaphor in your mind. And now you've found it, a story, a parable of the early career Paracelsus, demonstrating his theory of the tria prima, the three prime substances. In the demonstration, Paracelsus burned a piece of wood and observed the effects. Fire, the combustible element, represented the work of sulfur. The smoke, a curious substance that behaves similarly to both liquid and vapor, corresponded to mercury. And the ash left behind represented salt, the body, mind, and soul, the solid, the changeable, and the combustible. Now you draw your cauldron close, but you push away the vials of salt, sulfur, and mercury. Behind you, vapors are rising from cauldrons already and colorful smoke fills the room. But you can see what's in front of you clearly enough to proceed. You draw your wand from the pocket of your robes, the delicate alder wand engraved with feather patterns settles naturally into your grip. You reach now for the raven feather, It's shiny and black, reflecting blue tints in the candlelight on the teacher's table. It makes you think of Nora, your loyal raven familiar. She carries messages for you, keeps you company during late nights, practicing spell work or writing essays on historical wizards and witches. Her wings on the wind remind you of the promise of flight, the transcendence of the earthly plane. She's a bridge between the solid ground and the weightless air. You wonder where she is now, whether she's brought your message home to your loved one, or still soars atop the clouds in the open country. Closing your eyes, you can see her shiny black tail feathers fluttering in the breeze. And clear as day, you realize this is the most focused intention you've brought to mind in some time. She is your intention. You breathe deeply, channeling the thought of Nora, your appreciation of her, and imagining that intention sliding like liquid 
through a funnel from your head down your neck and shoulder through your wand arm then consciously pushing that liquid intention all the way down into your wand this extension of yourself This is the best technique you found for intention setting in your magical practice. You've always been gifted with a vivid imagination, and it only takes a few adjustments, some focus, to transform the images in your mind into fluid, propulsive magic. You can feel a tingling sensation in your wand arm, almost a radiant warmth. Intention is set. Now you must incorporate the tria prima into your experiment, but not, as your classmates seem to be doing, by literally combining the substances. Salt, sulfur, Mercury, it's not so literal, or at least it doesn't have to be. The parable of Paracelsus and the burning log showed you that all you need is the principle. Fire. Smoke. Ash. With your intention channeled, building with potential energy focused toward your wand, you utter the incantation to cast fire. Just a little toward the raven feather in your other hand, a tiny burst of flame shoots out of the tip of your wand and ignites the fine down of the feather. You hold it to your face, revolving the feather between your fingers, and your eyes sparkle in the wake of the small, licking flames. Then, when your hand just begins to feel the heat, you drop the feather lightly in the cauldron to continue smoldering. Lastly, Sacrifice. To achieve true alchemy and transformation, you must give something of yourself. All around you, wisps of colorful smoke are erupting from neighboring cauldrons, flashes of bright light, and small combustions. Giggling and exclamations of surprise and delight. Professor Lovage is smirking behind the table, not deigning to interfere in any of the goings-on. That's the point, you suppose. There are no expectations of the final product. It's an invitation to think about the principles of alchemy, to try your hand at something and to step into the shoes of those early natural philosophers and mystics who groped in the dark for answers to the universe's great mysteries. What can you give of yourself in this process? Thinking of your familiar and of your loved one to whom she now carries a homesick message What can you surrender now in the service of higher magic, in the service of self-transformation? Closing your eyes again, you reach inward, deep beneath the surface, into your very soul, where perhaps dragons battle, or stars work their celestial doings upon you. 
You reach for that hidden part of you, the part that can give just a little bit more. Your mind is clear, and your heartbeat is steady, serene. Eyes still closed, you can smell the slightly metallic tendrils of smoke rising from your cauldron. The fire's gone out. When you open your eyes, you look first to the head table to see that Professor Lovage is looking over at you, brow lifted in curiosity. You peer over the rim of your cauldron but you cast a shadow and can't see what's within. So you lift the small but heavy vessel and tip it out onto your desk. Out pours a fine powder, ash, and nothing more, as you expected. The kind of magic you've created is not about immediate results but about setting in motion the wheels of greater change within and without, as above, so below. But then, is it just the wink of the candlelight, a trick of the smoke-clouded chamber, Or are there fine flecks of shimmering yellow and red and deep blue in the slate gray ash before you? Are there hints in the ashes of gold? You run a hand over the powder which is soft and fine. It leaves a little residue on your fingertips And yes, when you look closer, there are tiny crystals there that gleam and glimmer in a hundred sparkling hues. You're not sure what it means, but a transformation has indeed taken place here. You feel the concentrated heat in your wand arm diffuse across your chest, filling your torso and warming your heart. You feel close to something new, though you're not sure what. The professor is rising from the chair behind the table, coming toward you, inspecting the ashes on your desk closely, feeling the powder between two fingers, a smile, and the knowing glance that seems to say you're on to something. The professor reviews the results of other projects around the classroom. Some students have produced curious crystalline compounds. Others have merely generated billowing fumes. A few wand waves and the smoke is quickly cleared. All in all, the professor is pleased with the class's willingness to experiment. You'll come back to this exercise at the end of term to see how far you've come and how much you've learned. But for now, the lesson is nearly over. The day is growing old and a silver dusk transforms the light in the classroom, making it almost shimmer with the brief, illusory magic of evening. Dinner will soon be served in the great feasting hall downstairs. But before you depart, says Professor Lovage, I've brought us a little surprise, a rare treat, and something I doubt many of you have ever seen in your lives. 
The professor crosses to the head table. Will the covered cage at last be addressed, you wonder? There's a preface to its unveiling, as you might have expected. The contents of the cage, you learn, are on loan from the school's beloved gamekeeper, Caradoc, a friendly fellow with a well-known soft spot for cryptids and magical creatures. Caradoc and Professor Lovage have a rather charming friendship and can be seen walking the school grounds together most evenings, discussing books and their travels. As it happens, Caradoc spent last summer in Greece where he picked up an extraordinary artifact, an egg, so old it might have been petrified by time. There was no expectation of it hatching. But just last week, on an unseasonably warm night, when the wind howled through the great forest, The miraculous happened. The egg hatched. And now, after a long build-up and with dramatic flair, the professor pulls the velvet covering from the cage. Within, blinking with silent curiosity, is a bird. Unlike any you've ever seen save in books, and reproductions. It's very small, perhaps the size of a canary, but its plumage is a deep ruby color with a tail not unlike a peacock's in its length and volume, here and there gilded, as if dipped in liquid gold. Exclamations of delight and awe erupt from across the room along with sighs from some of the girls at its cuteness. And the creature is adorable, with big, glassy eyes turned upward, sparkling. Yet there's a fierceness and a resilience to it, too. It's a marvel. He's only a baby now, says the professor gingerly opening the door of the cage and extending a hand toward the bird who steps right onto the palm. That he should grow to be the size of an eagle within the year. Rare as they may be, birds of his kind are blessed with immortality. He will grow old like any of us, and wither and weaken, but then he will build himself a nest of myrrh twigs, kindle a flame within his heart, and sacrifice himself upon the pyre. Then, from the ashes, he will be reborn, a child again, to begin the cycle anew. You can see then, why the phoenix is the ultimate symbol of alchemy. The professor, holding the tiny phoenix in the palm of a hand, carries the curious bird around the classroom for everyone to see up close. Now and then, the phoenix utters a weak coo, as if he's learning to produce his first song. Even in its feeble beginnings, the sound resonates in your head like the pealing of tiny bells. It seems to soften your mind and body, making you feel at once open, vulnerable, and ultimately resilient. When the professor brings the bird near you, a kind of radiant warmth and love seems to wash over you in waves. 
There's an audible gasp as the phoenix springs from the professor's hand, gently flapping his wings and whipping his long tail, which sparks and smokes behind him. The phoenix lands upon your desk and pecks lightly at the ashes before you. Without thinking or asking, you lift a soft, steady hand to stroke the bird on his neck. The downy red feathers are as the softest silk. The bird responds by contracting his neck and ruffling his feathers, turning to you with eyes slowly half-closing. Unmistakably, a smile. You can feel your heart soften and melt even more. What's his name? You hear yourself asking as the phoenix returns to the professor's hand. Hermes, says Professor Lovage with a grin, returning the phoenix to his cage. Of course, you think, after the ancient alchemist and father of hermeticism and the Greek counterpart of the Roman god Mercury. Class is dismissed. Most of the students, stomachs grumbling, make a beeline for the door and the steps down the tower. You take your time, cleaning up your station. The professor drapes the velvet once more over Hermes' cage. There comes a gentle cooing from within and then silence. You decide to keep the ashes from your experiment and you funnel the fine powder into an empty glass bottle from your bag, sealing it with a stopper. It may have some use in the future, but for now, it's a perfect souvenir of your first alchemical experiment. Before you leave, Professor Lovage calls out your name. Excellent work, the professor says. There's more to it than riches, gold, and everlasting life. Few students grasp that so quickly. You utter a word of thanks, wish the professor a good evening, and make your way to the door, descending the spiral steps of the tower. You take your supper in the feasting hall among friends. A few of your alchemy classmates sit nearby and soon the whole table is wrapped in conversation about the genuine phoenix that now resides on the school grounds. There's a great deal of excitement about how quickly the phoenix took to you. Perhaps that portends something for you, they suppose. You feel your cheeks flush, and you decline to comment, but in truth, Well, it did feel meaningful to be approached by such a rare, magical creature. It did make you feel somehow different, special. You'll hold on to that feeling like a spark as you continue your magical journey. After supper... You and your friends walk together back up to the dormitories, still chatting about the day's events and lessons. Your good friend Charlotte mastered a very advanced defensive spell in class today, one she's been working on for a long time. She can't wait to show you. Once back in your room, As your bunkmates prepare for bed, you sit on the cushioned seat of a window, cracked open to feel a chilly but comforting breeze 
watching the twilight grounds, the lake, the emerald green mountains of the highlands, the forest. Everything quakes with the passing wind. It's still light enough to see the circle of standing stones on the grounds, the gamekeeper's cabin and vegetable garden, and you're fairly certain that the two figures you see walking near the edge of the forest, one large, one small, are the gamekeeper Caradoc and Professor Lovage. Above them, flitting and fluttering, is a flash of crimson and gold. Your eyes drift toward the darkening sky where the first stars are beginning to emerge from a purplish pall. And there, against the settling of night over the highlands, raven dark wing beats. Nora, returning to you already, a scroll of parchment tied to her leg. A letter from home. A brisk morning breeze sweeps in through the open dormitory window, bringing a marvelous and invigorating mixture of scents with it. Musky heather meets the aroma of fresh pastry, which rises from the kitchens and the feasting hall on the ground floor of the castle. You stuff final supplies into your backpack, binoculars, gloves, a raincoat, a few snacks, and a jar of protective herbal salt, which you made in your apothecary class last term. Just in case. It's no ordinary field trip on which you embark today, and you do well to be prepared for any eventuality. Everything fits comfortably, thanks to your just having mastered a charm to enlarge the volume of any container without increasing its surface area. You count yourself fortunate to have such an opportunity. Only a handful of students were approved to spend the quiet summer term at the School of Sorcery to participate in accelerated coursework and research. Ever since taking Professor Crow's introductory course, on magical creatures in your second year, you've been drawn to the study of mythical beasts and cryptids. It wasn't a subject you expected to love so much. Sure, who wouldn't enjoy learning to care for unicorns or searching the skies for phoenixes or firebirds? But you once assumed it would be an easy course of study, a place to coast on curiosity alone. Instead, you found that the study of magical creatures awakened you to an entirely new world. There's an entire occult ecosystem of fauna who exist in the shadowy thresholds of the natural world, unseen by those who've never looked beyond the veil to the world of spirit. These creatures bring magical, medicinal, and ecological insight to a world hungry for connection. It's a special privilege, you realize, to witness these creatures. Where you, a student of magic and sorcery, rely on your wand, your books, and other tools for your spell work, 
Most of these beasts have such an innate relationship to magic that it moves through their existence effortlessly, like breath. The unicorn has natural powers of healing. The nixie can shapeshift, and the siren's song rings with irresistible enchantment. They do not do magic as a witch or a wizard does. They are magic in their very essence. It's this quality that drew you beyond a superficial interest in the beautiful or monstrous beings. Your curiosity ever since has been insatiable. So it was with decided eagerness that you scribbled your name on the sign-up sheet for this weekend's adventure and convinced your friend Sam to do the same. Slinging your backpack over a shoulder, you pull the dormitory window closed and head downstairs. Sam should be waiting for you at breakfast. It's such a comfort to be excused from wearing school uniforms and robes for a day. This trip calls for outdoor clothing, hiking boots, and light layers. All you really know is that Professor Crow is calling the outing Field Research Hike, Magical Fauna, and that you're headed for somewhere in the mountains that surround the castle and the glen. It's an overnight camping trip, which suggests you'll travel quite far into the wilderness You're excited to explore the region in depth and with such a knowledgeable teacher. As professors go, she's been here a relatively short time, having transferred from a post at the wizard school in North America. But in the two or so years she's taught here, she's earned a reputation as one of the most engaging and inspired instructors in the castle. You learned it firsthand when you took our class. Unlike other teachers who spend lesson after lesson droning on about theory before getting to the real work of spellcraft, potion making, and the like, Professor Crow started term by bringing you and your classmates out into the forest on a scavenger hunt for legendary creatures. Certainly now, in your fourth year of school, you understand that theory is important in laying the foundations of a magical education. But Professor Crow somehow manages to instill it without dull lectures or lengthy readings. Under her stewardship, you learn through exploration, inquiry, and experience. This field research hike promises to be just as enlivening. You trot down the grand marble staircase of the medieval castle which houses your school. The figures and the portraits that line the corridors are still snoozing soundly. For most, after all, it is summer vacation. And who would choose to be up this early on a lazy Sunday in July? Still, You have a spring in your step, and the oncoming wafts of breakfast smells from the feasting hall draw you in with increased enjoyment. Even in summer, the cooks have gone all out to provide a hearty meal for the early risers. When you enter the hall, you see a single long table laden with delicious foods, pastries and sausages, and toast and eggs sunny side up and self-sizzling on enchanted plates. Pitcher after pitcher of juices, teas, and coffee. The smell is heavenly. You fill up a plate with your favorites, knowing you'll need a filling breakfast to fuel up for the journey. Sam is seated with a few other students in hiking clothes. You recognize most of them from classes in the regular term, and others are in your accelerated class with Professor Crow. There are only a dozen or so students in the feasting hall now, out of about 20 or 30 spending the summer here. The rest must be enjoying a lion. 
You move to join Sam and company. They greet you cheerfully and make space on the bench. They're already engaged in spirited speculation as to the subject of today's trip. I think it's dragons, says Lula Vaughn, a freckled fifth year with a penchant for exaggeration. Has to be. I don't think so, says Sam, taking a bite of buttered toast. Too dangerous. I don't think we'd be allowed to be up close with dragons, do you? Depends, Lula responds. Some dragons are nice, I heard. No, I think it has to be that phoenix, chimes in Violet Lucas, a witch from your year who's always been at the top of the class. Didn't you hear about it? Professor Lovage was caring for it until it got too big, and then set it free in the mountains. I heard about it from some of the students in alchemy class. You have heard the rumors of a phoenix being kept in the castle. It's an intriguing possibility. You've never seen one up close. But then there are a thousand magical creatures you've never seen up close. What do you think it is? Sam asks you. I suppose it could be anything, you say. But I don't know, I thought we'd just be making general observations over whatever things we do find in the mountains. Pixies and little things. You're met with a chorus of dissent. The last time Professor Crow led a field research trip like this, says Violet, the group came back saying they'd all observed a kitsune. What's a kitsune, you ask? It's a kind of a spirit fox, Violet continues. They're really rare, haven't been seen in generations, and almost never in this part of the world. They can live a thousand years and have tons of magical properties. Wow, says Sam. I'd love to see one of those. But what I'm saying is, Violet goes on, there's a precedent, you see. There must be something really special up in the mountains that the professor is taking us to observe. The conversation at breakfast amplifies your anticipation. After filling your bellies, you and a gaggle of classmates make for the meet-up point, the ancient stone circle on the castle grounds. The fortress itself is something like a thousand years old, but the stone monument predates it by centuries signifying this locale's deep associations with magic and the sacred. Approaching the stones in the light of early morning, you can almost feel the vibrations coming off them, haloed by golden sun. Professor Crow is waiting for you beside the circle. She holds a hand over her eyes to behold your cohort's approach, and she waves broadly with the other, She's dressed in what you've come to recognize as her signature attire, a flannel shirt with sleeves rolled up to the elbows, faded jeans and hiking boots. A thick braid of dark hair hangs over one shoulder. To her left are eight school-issued broomsticks, hovering a few feet off the ground. She greets you warmly, exuding a calm confidence about the weekend's prospects. Two more students eventually join you just moments before the scheduled departure time. There are seven students in total, all of whom you've had some interaction with before. Grab a broom, everyone, Professor Crow says, gesturing to the floating broomsticks. We're going to fly to the base of the ridge, and then we'll continue on foot anyone not comfortable taking a shortcut across the lake. You and your classmates regard the great lake and surrounding mountains as Professor Crow indicates the peak in question. The water sparkles, reflecting the emerald green of the highlands. No one seems to object to the shortcut. So you mount your brooms and kick off from the ground following the professor's lead. It's a beautiful morning for a ride. 
If it weren't for the pack slung over your shoulder, you'd feel weightless. Tiny droplets of mist twinkle in your hair before evaporating in the sunlight. You fan out over the vast and tranquil lake, its glossy surface a mirror of motion blur. You have a breathtaking view of the highlands from here, the jade blanket of forests dappled by the shadows of scudding clouds and their reflection on the glittering waters below. The depths of the lake are unknown and the body of water is rumored to be home to countless mythical aquatic creatures. You imagine kelpies, mermaids, and all kinds of water sprites lingering below the surface. You'll have to ask Professor Crow what she knows about the lake's inhabitants. Soon you touch down on the far side of the lake at the base of the mountains. Leaving the brooms behind, you follow Professor Crow toward the mouth of a narrow path that disappears into the thicket of trees. She moves with confidence, having charted these paths a hundred times, you imagine. As you hike the steep trail, she points out the native flora of the mountainside. The trees are mostly Scots pine, with brushy needles that stick in your hair. But aspen graces the path, too, its leaves a flutter like a thousand hands applauding, and a witch elm and an oak. Here and there, a mountain hare darts in and out of the low-lying foliage. The professor encourages you to observe any and everything you come across on this excursion, whether it is considered magical or not. For even the so-called ordinary plants and animals carry ancient associations, wisdom, and medicine. The rowan, for example, is considered a protective tree against malevolent spirits and witches. A chuckle runs through the class at this remark, for the rowan doesn't seem to be warding off this bunch of witches and wizards. It's a few minutes of quiet hiking before you hear a gasp from Violet. She then urgently whispers for everyone to gather and look at something. You all circle round her eagerly as she points to a smudge of black through the trees. You squint to see it better, and you realize that it's a cat. It looks just like a common house cat, really, except for something you can't quite pinpoint. Its fur is black, save for a spot of white on its chest. It moves slowly through the forest, rubbing its sides along the scratchy trunks of the trees, apparently ignorant or uninterested in your presence. As it draws slowly nearer your group, you realize what's so unusual about the thing. Its size. Though it resembles an ordinary cat, it is significantly larger than any you've ever seen, almost the size of a Labrador. Well done, Violet, whispers the professor. That's a good find. Everyone, this is what's called a cat she. It won't harm us, but I wouldn't get too close. Get a good look, and then let's move on. I'll tell you more about it once we're a few paces down the path. You watch for a few moments longer until the unusual animal begins to lazily saunter away into the thickening trees beyond. Then you turn with your classmates and follow Professor Crow onward. The cat she is a fairy creature, she says, holding aside a jutting branch of pine for you and the other students to pass. And it's quite common to find them prowling the highlands if you're looking for them. Quite harmless to most of us, most of the time. But come Sawin, you'll notice that the cooks at the school are sure to put out a saucer of milk for them, leaving an offering 
will ensure you the Kachi's blessing, but a snub will earn you their wrath. I thought it looked a bit like Ajax, Sam mutters to you with a smile. This makes you laugh. You hadn't realized it before, but Sam's familiar, a black cat named Ajax, has a similar patch of white fur on his chest. Maybe Ajax is really a cat she, you return. Then I'd better start leaving him saucers of milk, I suppose, Sam jokes. Though the hike is long and hard work, the cool air and fragrance of the forest remains totally uplifting. The camphoric scent of evergreen needles is like a salve for sore muscles. Lula Vaughn hovers close to the professor, throwing out guesses as to what kind of creature you're headed to see, but Crow remains tight-lipped. It's better to keep it a surprise, she says. But keep up, everyone, she adds, turning to the stragglers. We want to be sure we reach it in time. This cryptic instruction heightens the excitement of the moment. Whatever it is you're going to see, there must be some sort of happening associated with it. You hurry to catch up. You've been lingering to observe a beautiful, shimmering moss growing on the side of a large rock. The moss seems to change color under your eye, shifting more and more rapidly the more intently you observe it. When you find yourself shoulder to shoulder with Professor Crow on the path, she smiles at you with indulgence. Find something of interest, she asks. I think so, you say. Some sort of a color-changing moss. Ah, she says knowingly. What would you think if I told you that moss isn't a plant, but an animal? Really, you say, astonished. Well, it's still a subject of study among people in my field. Some say plant, others say animal. I lean somewhere in between, says Professor Crow. If it's something you're interested in, I could give you some readings, or even a research project. Oh, you say, taken aback unconsciously nodding. Just give it some thought, she responds with a reassuring wink. The sun's sweet rays drip honey gold upon the forest floor, deepening with summer afternoon. The breeze awakens with the perfume of heather, and somewhere ahead through the trees is a glimmer of deep undulating purple. Professor Crow continues on, beckoning for you all to follow. Soon you emerge onto an open clearing, a rocky mountainside alive with rolling heather, its waves like a violet ocean. You turn and see the other peaks around you, rising up into a clear blue sky. Far over the trees, you can just make out the turrets of the castle, the school of sorcery, beyond the unseen lake. Nearly there, says the professor. Come along. Nostrils alight with the aromatic honey of heather, you hike on. With the deepest forests behind you, cliffs and ledges lie ahead and you're surrounded on all sides by nature's towering majesty. Before leading you in a single file down a rocky and treacherous path along the side of a cliff, Professor Crow retrieves her wand. With a muttered incantation and a wave of the instrument, she conjures up what appears to be a string of golden light. Drawing with her wand in thin air, she sends the quivering string forth where it zigzags and entwines with itself, forming, as it were, a kind of railing along the path. 
Hold on as you go, Professor Crow says, moving forth to demonstrate. It's quite safe. One by one, you step out onto the path, taking hold of the guardrail. To your surprise, it's cool to the touch and strong as steel or diamond filament. It makes you feel completely secure on the cliffside path. You sense from the professor's energy that you are nearing the site of your focused observation imminently. There's a palpable excitement in the air as she indicates for you to lower your voices and move slowly from this point forward. On the other side of the railed path, there's another steep but short climb to a rocky ledge. Using a similar invocation, Professor Crow conjures what looks like a rope ladder out of the same golden thread-like material. You climb. The professor assists each student onto the ledge which is more than large enough to accommodate your whole class. But from here, there doesn't seem to be anywhere else to go. There's a grand escarpment opposite you, from which a number of trees grow precipitously. The nearest one, you realize, boasts a large, disc-like something. From the wave of gasps that ripples through your class, you infer that everyone has noticed at around the same time. It's a nest. You're roughly 10 or 15 meters from it, a safe distance, but near enough to make out the nest's inhabitant quite clearly. There, in the center of the swirl of branches and flotsam is, perhaps, the most magnificent creature you've ever seen. Its head is the sleek, feathered head of an eagle, with a hooked bill and fierce, golden eyes. Its feathers flick upward in two tufts on either side of its head, like the ears of an owl, or you reflect almost like a pair of horns. Hanging over the side of the nest are its two bird-like legs with curling talons and bursting from its shoulders are two great folded wings. But from there, the creature's semblance to an eagle ends as the feathers blend to fur. Its back half, from what you can see, contains the haunches of a great mammal. As you watch, the creature flicks its tail, another rush of gasps moves through your group. It's the tail of a lion. The sun falls upon the animal with such an angle as to make it gleam like it's painted with gold leaf. Apart from the swish of the tail, it is perfectly still, like a statue you might see adorning the halls of the school of sorcery. For a time, you simply marvel in awestruck silence. But eventually someone speaks. It's Sam. Professor, your friend asks, is that, is it a griffin? Very good, says Professor Crow. You don't dare take your eyes off the beautiful beast in the nest, but you can hear the smile in her voice. I discovered the nest here a few months ago, and I've been watching her since. They're benevolent creatures, but prefer their privacy. So we won't go any closer. She won't mind that we're here, as long as we don't disturb her. But you've spotted something else in the nest. At first you're hesitant to ask, but eventually you open your mouth to speak. Are those eggs? you inquire. Yes, says the professor. Good eye. And if we've timed our visit right, 
we should be able to see them hatch. A few of your classmates are suddenly overcome with excited giggles, but they manage to keep their voices down in respect for the nest. Professor Crow instructs you to get out your notebooks. While you wait, you are to record detailed observations of the griffin, her habitat, behaviors, and environment. You and Sam sit shoulder to shoulder on a large boulder that makes for a relatively comfortable chair. Retrieving your field notebooks and pencils, you begin recording what you see. You find it easiest to jot down a few notes, then make rough sketches for the nest and the griffin. She is so still, barely moving for minutes at a time, even her breath so slow and steady as to appear immobile. You sketch the eggs, their domed tops just visible over the edge of the tangle of nest shining golden as the griffin's feathers in the afternoon sun. You notice the materials of the nest, brown needled branches of pine, wilted stalks of heather, and tender reeds, probably foraged from the shores of the lake. As you sketch and scribble, Professor Crow speaks in a muted tone about the history and mythology of the griffin. They were known, it seems, in diverse cultures across the world, with records stretching back to ancient times. Depictions of the griffin appear in Mesopotamian artifacts as early as 4000 BCE. In Greece, they ornamented votive cauldrons, signifying their invocation and ceremony. They appeared, along with many other magical beasts, in the bestiaries of Pliny the Elder, at whom witches and wizards have often scoffed for his inaccurate descriptions, but to whom you nevertheless owe a great debt for his attempts to preserve histories both natural and supernatural. The feathers, claws, and eggs of the griffin were highly valued in the Middle Ages for their rarity. Looking now upon the golden sheen of the eggs, it's easy to understand why. No matter where or when you reflect, gold is always precious. There were some things, according to the professor, that non-magical record keepers got right about the majestic creatures. The griffin's feather does have the ability to restore sight to the blind, as some folklore espouses, but the feather must be willingly given before incorporated into the brewing of a potion. They are solitary creatures by nature, but loyal and are known to form bonds with humans from time to time. Forging a friendship with a griffin is an auspicious thing, says Professor Crow, for you'll have a lifelong protector, a bestower of gifts and wisdoms. They made for life as well. In time, as happened with all the creatures classed as magical, or mythical. The griffins retreated from the ordinary world, relocating to remote spaces and centers of magical energy, like these mountains. The world of humankind had grown increasingly unwelcoming. It was no difficult adjustment for the griffin, who already preferred solitude and privacy but for other creatures like household sprites, the displacement was a hardship. That's why, says Professor Crow, the study of cryptids and magical fauna is important. In this field, 
we aim for the preservation of species, but also the restoration of a harmonious relationship between humanity and our environment. The plants and animals and the earth sustain us. It's our responsibility to care for them in return. You wonder to yourself, what is the best way to care for this griffin? She who looks so at home, so independent in her nest. Perhaps that simple act of noticing, observing, is enough for now. Learning her history and her relationship to the land on which your school stands might be the first steps toward becoming a steward of the place. As the sun ages to a crimson disk over the westernmost peaks, you imagine a world teeming with extraordinary wildlife. Griffins and dragons and unicorns of frolic, with horses and foxes and cats and toads. What would it take to bring magic out of hiding? To make it safe for the creatures of mystery to walk the earth again, you wonder. What would it take to re-enchant the world? You emerge from your musings as a large shadow sweeps across the ledge on which you and the class sit. All wings and wonder. You look up just in time to see a second griffin, this one larger and streaked with scarlet plumage on its breast, soar overhead. There's her mate, says Professor Crow in response to half a dozen unuttered questions. You'll have been out foraging for food for her. Home just in time. The second griffin lands in the nest next to his companion, dropping something, presumably a meal, from his talons. They greet each other fondly, brushing their heads along each other's necks. Only moments later, the first egg begins to crack. The air crackles with anticipation, You reach hastily into your bag for your binoculars and hold them to your eyes to get a clearer view. Little by little, the egg nearest the edge of the nest gathers hairline fractures that trace a labyrinth across its surface. And finally, after what seems like an eternity of waiting, a beak emerges from the egg, followed by the feathered head of a baby griffin. The mother and father help it to leave its shell, revealing the bat conscious. It's probably the size of a large hawk or a lion cub, but next to its spectacularly large parents, it looks tiny, timid, and vulnerable. The mother griffin nuzzles the first hatchling tenderly. Once the first is born, the other eggs, four in total, follow quickly behind. Soon the nest is crowded with young. Only minutes later, they begin to wrestle and play with each other, winding between the legs of their mother and father. A whole griffin family forms before your eyes, here in the hidden peaks of the highlands. How many other miraculous things are happening at this very moment, you wonder? How many eggs are hatching? How many new souls are being born? How many quiet, seemingly ordinary occurrences are changing someone's world every second of every day. The greatest gift, you think, 
of this course of study is the imperative to observe, to notice the world in all its splendor and all its mundanity, to make each moment matter. The afternoon wanes, a purplish curtain falling softly over the cliffside in the sun's vacancy. The griffin hatchlings have fallen asleep at their mother's side, overtired from the excitement of their emergence into light and life. For the first time, as the exhilaration of the event washes away, you feel tired too, as if your body has just caught up to the great effort of the hour's long hike. A haze of exhaustion relaxes your eyelids and shoulders. It's about time, the professor says, to make your way back down and set up camp. So back you go, one by one down the golden ladder and across the pebbled path with hands clinging to the rail of light. The light is kind to you, providing just enough visibility as you go, then abruptly vanishing as the sun sinks behind the mountains and just as you reach the heathered hillside. Everyone instinctively pulls out their wands, conjuring up an assemblage of glowing orbs, magical lanterns, which bob and float in your wake. The musk of the heather rises on a cool evening breeze, redolent of summer camping trips with friends and family. Laughter and conversation fill the air as you set up tents, raising them together with your wands in coordinated effort. There are three altogether set upon the evenest ground on the hill one for the professor, and two for the class to share. They're the size of normal camping tents, which would surely be snug, but comfortable enough to fit a few people crosswise. But these are, after all, magical tents, and therefore considerably larger on the inside. Before everyone retires, however, Professor Crow lights a campfire and invites you all to join and eat and reflect on the day's experience. The fire crackles pleasantly, the warmth wafting off it to ward against the oncoming chill of night. You feel the bittersweet tingle of nostalgia sitting by the campfire, a wistfulness for childhood and the awakening of whimsy. Though what could be more whimsical, more enchanting, than everything you've witnessed today? Again, you think what a great gift it is to be charged with noticing, with bearing witness to the magic in the everyday. Without prompting, and entirely organically, your classmates begin to speak about their observations and experiences. Lula remarks that she was surprised to hear griffins mated for life, but then when she saw the bond between the mated pair, she understood it completely. Violet volunteers a reflection on the components of the nest, which, according to her keen examination, included parts of plants that are not native to the region, This sparks a brief but fascinating discussion about the migratory patterns of griffins and other mythical birds. Evidently, very little research has been done into such things. Violet seems interested in studying the matter further. You are hesitant to add any thoughts to the discussion at first, but you grow more comfortable as others share. It's as though the shared effort of the hike and experience of observing the griffin's nest has formed a kind of fellowship between you and your classmates. 
a closeness and vulnerability that was not there before. It sparkles, impermanent as the sparks of the flame, but just as warm and inviting. I was thinking, you say, about hybrid creatures, griffins and sphinxes and such, magical animals that are a mixture of two ordinary creatures. Where do they come from? What do they mean? After a brief pause, Professor Crow meets your gaze across the fire with a smile and a twinkle in her eye. What do you think? She asks. I don't know, you say. But I suppose there's something interesting about standing between two different worlds. The lion and the eagle, land and sky. Or like people, land and sea. Sometimes I feel like I walk in two worlds, too. For a moment, you're unsure if anyone will understand what you mean. But shortly thereafter, several of your classmates chime in with comments like, I feel that way too. Or, yeah, my family aren't witches or wizards, so I always feel like I'm kind of a bridge. I think that's very astute, says Professor Crow. There's a reason griffins and sphinxes and other hybrid creatures have been represented for millennia as the guardians of gateways or portals. It acknowledges their unique abilities to bridge separate paths. Even behind the heat of the fire, you can feel your cheeks flush. It's a wonderful feeling of validation and acceptance. You're glad Sam is here with you, and you sincerely hope this circle convenes again. Soon the fragrant evening, lit by campfire and floating lights, grows old, and the gatherers round the fire recognize their exhaustion. Extinguishing the fire, Professor Crow reminds you of your departure time in the morning and urges you to be ready to hike down the mountain, bright and early. You and your classmates retire to the two tents to rest. Lifting the flap of your tent's entrance, you marvel at the sheer size of the interior. Inside, it's the size of a cottage, complete with three separate bedrooms for each of the students sharing the tent. There's a common area that's furnished like a cabin in the American Southwest, with thick woven blankets slung over the backs of couches and armchairs. There's even a kitchen, a fireplace, and a generous hearth. Sam and Violet have joined you as tent mates, and though you're tempted to sit for a while more, and decompress over a cup of tea, your bones are simply too weary. You bid your friends good night and retreat to the bedroom on the far left. You collapse into the bed in the corner of the room, letting all the effort and strain of the day melt from your body with an audible sigh. You release everything. Curling up under the wool blankets, you close your eyes. Immediately, visions of fledgling griffins fill your imagination. You can almost hear their wing beats overhead. Beyond the walls of the tent, the buzz of insects and call of night birds creates a low, trembling quilt of white noise. A symphony of community and connection. For a few moments just before you drift to sleep, you try to pick out some of the specific noises and attach them to creatures you know. 
the tremolo of a tawny owl, the cat-like call of a pine martin. There are sounds you don't recognize, and your sleepy, swimming mind fills with all manner of fantastical pictures. Winged lions, shape-shifting cats, and finned horses. A bewitching bestiary pulls your bed like a chariot to the golden gateways of sleep. The castle is always a flutter at this time of year. The afternoons blush swiftly to vespertine tranquility, and students of sorcery love to linger on the grounds until the last of the light. Drawing toward darkness, there's a palpable sense of magic tingling in the air about the place even more so than in other seasons. For this is a place of ancient magic, where centuries of young sorcerers have sought their training. Traditionally, students are expected to be inside by nightfall, though with shorter days, the staff grow lax about the exact timing of this retreat indoors. But tonight, a select few of you have been granted special dispensation to be about the grounds much later than usual. This puts a quiet thrill in you that you can't quite explain. Although you can't say you've been looking forward to midterm examinations, you have to admit that the circumstances of this evening's gathering have piqued your curiosity. Instead of meeting in the classroom in which you've spent weeks studying the art of herbalism and potion making, you're expected to take the examination outdoors this evening. The news arrived on the wings of one of the school's messenger ravens, a note from Professor Bain with a meeting time, location, and a reminder to bring your wand and dress for cool weather. You haven't had the chance to confer with any of your classmates yet, Today's schedule was packed with classes, cramming, and homework, but you're eager to find out what they think the exam will be. The course thus far has been one of the more fascinating you've taken in your time at the School of Sorcery. The professor, a renowned potion maker, brings intimate knowledge of wart cunning to the classroom, along with an intuitive approach to brewing technique. She's a marvel to watch in demonstration, combining the fundamentals of potion making with a poetic sense of the significance of each ingredient. Never have you truly appreciated the properties of, say, ivy. But after one lecture, you feel deeply connected to both the mythological and medicinal significance of the plant. So much so that any time 
while strolling the castle grounds, you come upon a wall of climbing ivy. You feel compelled to bow your head in reference to it. This driver away of ill spirits and symbol of the Roman god Bacchus. And thusly, every potion you've brewed in the hands-on classes has been imbued with greater magic. You've rarely felt more inspired. As the hour draws near, you close the potion's textbook on your lap and reach to your wardrobe for a knitted sweater to throw on over your shirt. You pull your school robes on over that, tucking your wand safely in the inner pocket. There's only so much studying you can do for this kind of exam, you suppose. Professor Bain isn't the type to expect you to have memorized a hundred recipes. More likely, you'll be challenged to demonstrate core skills and fundamentals of herbalism and potion making. At the last moment, before leaving the dormitory, you reach for a little box under your bed. Inside are several small items collected from your time here. But there is one object in particular you seek, a small bronze coin. During your first ever class at the School of Sorcery, this coin was part of a first-level spell for good fortune. And after a few years, you fancy it still carries a bit of good luck, even if it's all in your mind. You slip the coin in your pocket, hoping it brings you success in tonight's exam. And with that, you're off and out the door. Passing by the portraits and landscapes on the walls, you make your winding way down the steps of the old castle. There's plenty of time, you think to detour through your favorite corridor, the one lined with dozens of authentic suits of armor. They gleam in the golden spill of light afternoon light from the pointed windows, making them appear like something out of a dream. There's a spiral stone stairway at the end of the hall, which leads straight down into the belly of the castle, the grand feasting hall, and the entrance. It's early for supper, but since you'll be out on the grounds until who knows how late, you make a stop in the feasting hall to fill up on snacks before you go down to the meeting place. During exam week especially, the cooks make sure to have round-the-clock sustenance available. You've certainly run down here at midnight to gather pastries and sandwiches during an all-night study session for alchemy. A few others from your potions class seem to have the same idea as you. They're stuffing their pockets with pies as you enter the hall. Minutes later, having stashed as many items as you can fit in your robes, you and your classmates depart the feasting hall together, making for the castle grounds. Professor Bain's note instructed you to meet her at the mouth of the forest, near the caretaker's cottage. It's still just barely light, as you start down the craggy hill toward the forest below, so there's good visibility. Smoke 
puffs from the chimney of the little cottage in the basin where the caretaker sleeps. His garden is flush with fall florals. Dizzying dahlias and zinnias abound. And beyond that, a homegrown pumpkin patch with some of the most magnificent pumpkins you've ever seen. On your approach, you catch a whiff of whatever is cooking inside the caretaker's cabin, something superbly spiced. But on past the cottage and garden you go, to the base of the great slope where the grass meets the dark foliage of a big, wild forest. As students, unless accompanied by a professor for educational reasons, you're not allowed in the wood. Rumor has it that all manner of magical creatures run rampant therein, from unicorns to manticores. You wonder if tonight's assignment will take you past the threshold of those border trees for the first time. And there, set at equal intervals, right along the grass at the edge of the wood, are nine wide-mouthed cauldrons hung over small piles of kindling. Nine cauldrons, one per student. It is achingly picturesque, the sight. Something about it stirs an indescribable sense of magic within you, making your skin tighten into goosebumps. Until now, you don't think you'd noticed that there were exactly nine students in the advanced potions class. And as you learned in a numerology primer last year, nine is a number of profound magical significance. The nine worlds of the Norse cosmology, nine Greek muses, goddesses of inspiration, nine great Egyptian deities, the Celtic ninth wave, which separates our world from the other world. Beside each cauldron is a small platform, a work surface, complete with mortar and pestle, vials, droppers, knives, a leather purse, and stirring instruments. But unless you are mistaken, there are no ingredients in sight. For all your musings on taking in the spectacle of the cauldron set up, you almost miss the presence of Professor Bain. She's standing hands on hips by the woodside with a stack of leather-bound books levitating nearby. Come on down, then, she beckons to you. I can see the rest are on their way. You turn back toward the castle to see a smattering of students bounding down the hill in the waning light. Professor Bain waves to them with a smile. You can all take one of these, she says, indicating the textbooks. You step forward to take a copy for yourself, just as the professor politely asks that you not open them just yet. Heeding her plea, you run your fingers across the aged cover and the embossed title, Laknunga. I had to pull some strings with the bookseller 
to bring in this many copies, says the professor, but I'm sure you'll all treat them with the utmost respect. I want to return them in as good a condition as I received them. Now she hands the final copies to the stragglers with a smirk as they come huffing and puffing to the edge of the wood. You glance around and count in your mind. Everyone's here. A moment later, the hourly bell chimes from the castle, clamoring an echo against the trunks of the trees. The sun is quietly disappearing over the mountains and the lake, leaving amber and purple streaks across the sky. The evening star is visible, blinking beside the emergent moon, a pale pink crescent. Well, says the professor. I suppose we'll get started. We've only a little light left, and I'd like to get you on your way before too late. She instructs each of you to select a cauldron. They're all equally suitable for tonight's exam, she assures you, and each filled with pure water that was charged under last night's waning moon. And open your books to the marked page. This you do, and are bemused to find that the page in question is not composed in your native tongue. You almost go cross-eyed looking at the words, which are very nearly familiar but just a bit off. Not to worry, says Professor Bain, regarding all the bemused expressions. It's old English, but I trust you all know the translation charm. A few heads nod, and wands come out. You retrieve your wand and tap it against the page, muttering, Translatio Anglia. Before your eyes, the letters briefly glow, then seem to flip over in place, unveiling the text anew in plain English. You notice the classmate beside you struggling to remember the incantation. You are about to offer help, when another student, the famously brainy Charlotte, leans in to assist, tapping her wand inside the pages of his textbook. You look back to the page and read the fine lettering at the top. What you have before you is the recipe for something called the Nine Herbs Charm, the professor says. If you've paid attention in class at all so far, you might remember me mentioning it. This text is from the 10th century, but the recipe is certainly much older. It's a classic healing charm that works against venoms and poisons. We work under the waning crescent, a powerful moon phase for healing magic. For tonight's examination, I'd like each of you to create your own potion using the ingredients laid out in the Nine Herbs charm. But here's my favorite part. Here, a smile of utter delight crosses the professor's face. You'll see, I haven't provided you with any ingredients save the water. That's because everything you need 
is out here in the forest. You'll be gathering your own herbs this evening. A well-timed shiver of cold breeze punctuates the professor's words. You feel again a strange thrill. Now, Professor Bain continues, there's no need to worry about going into the wood at this hour. I've been hard at work all day placing protective enchantments and barriers to keep you safe. If you come to the edge of the protected area, you'll come up against a strong veil of magic. Collect the nine herbs as laid out in the recipe, but be mindful of their properties as you go. Some may require extra caution. You'll be evaluated not on a perfect recreation of the recipe, but on your mastery of potion-making fundamentals while incorporating the proper ingredients. You might discover an entirely new way of using the ingredients together toward surprising ends. If you're called to creativity, Embrace it. Are there any questions? As it turns out, there are many questions, but the professor has an answer for each. Professor, one classmate chimes in, this recipe looks more like a poem. The teacher's eyes sparkle in the dim twilight. Ah, she says, with an edge of mystery gilding her voice. Potions are poems. Recipes are recitations. Let the poetry guide you to each plant's inherent magic. By the time the last of the light is disappearing over the mountains, you're itching to begin foraging in the woods, contented with Professor Bain's precautions and instructions. Once all the students are satisfied, she turns you loose to seek the nine ingredients. The very first thing you do is mutter the incantation to illuminate the tip of your wand. Instantly it brightens, sending a beam of silvery light across the grass and toward the forest. In your periphery, you see several other wand tips spring to light and bounce off in between the trees. Tucking the book under one arm, and taking a few useful instruments from the table beside your cauldron, you find an opening in the trees ahead and venture into the wood. As you go, the baubles of light from your classmates spiral off into other directions, soon vanishing from your sight. The darkness of the forest settles around you, along with an unearthly quiet, yet it's oddly comforting. You come seeking plants, listening for the messages they whisper, so the darkness and quiet only amplify your senses. Once you've gone a few strides into the thicket, scanning the forest floor with your wand light, you begin to notice familiar foliage, mosses and flowers gathered round above-ground roots. You stop, reopening the textbook to the recipe for the nine herbs charm. 
your classmate was right, rather than a straightforward list of needed ingredients. The text reads like Anglo-Saxon poetry, with the poet addressing each plant in turn, praising its achievements and qualities. Of mugwort, they write, you were called Una, oldest of warts. You have power against poison and against infection. And waybread, or plantain, they hail as mother of herbs, open from the east, mighty inside. You are pleased to find that each and every herb listed in the recipe is one you've worked with or studied under Professor Bain, each with its own mythological weavings and medicinal uses. Most of them you'd recognize on sight, and the rest, fortunately, are illustrated on subsequent pages of the text. And with delight, you find the first of the plants you seek speckling the forest floor about your feet. You might recognize this plant anywhere for its daisy-like flowers, white petals with bright golden eyes. You've hung such flowers out to dry and steeped them into teas for rest and calm. It's chamomile. Bending down to gather armfuls of the flowers, you softly swoon at the delicate scent, so reminiscent of cozy nights by the fireside, clutching a mug of hot tea. Your mind spins back to a particular memory of convalescing from a lingering cold when a beloved caregiver brought you chamomile tea and a warm compress for your forehead. How your body tingled and mind went fuzzy after drinking it, sending you sweetly into a regenerative sleep from which you awoke with your fever broken, a new energy. It's right that this should be a chief ingredient in a classic healing potion. You're not sure how much you'll need of each herb, but you recall the professor's advice in an early gathering of the class to harvest respectfully never taking more than half. You're sure there are more patches of chamomile sprinkled throughout the forest, but still you have a mind to leave some for your other classmates. So, you carefully cut a few sprigs of chamomile and stash them in the leather bag. One down, you think. Eight more to go. Quite quickly, you're able to find the footprints of several other required ingredients along the way. Whey bread or greater plantain. Lamb's grass creeping over damp soil entwined with a different silvery herb. Chervil with its feathery leaves, which, when rubbed between your fingers, release an oil with the aroma of myrrh. Betony, a miraculous plant with the ability to soften anxiety, arthritis, migraines, and more. Also a favorite of those who seek protection against dark sorcery. The woods are quiet still, disturbed only by the distant warble 
of nocturnal birds and the music of soft wind through the canopy. The trees here are old, some maybe thousands of years old, twisting together at their leafy tops and perhaps deep in the ground. You make your own path now, for the roots grow thickly above the soil, making obstacles and labyrinths to traverse. An alley of oak brings you to a small stream, beside which grows a cluster of fennel flowers, another of your sought herbs. You kneel to cut the stalks carefully, releasing the anise-like fragrance. You recall Professor Bain's lecture on the curative properties of fennel and its cousins, their powerful aids for digestion, and even able to improve one's eyesight. But beyond the medicinal use, you are reminded of fennel's place In classical mythology, it was inside a hollow fennel stalk that Prometheus, the titan, concealed the spark of fire to bring to mankind. Though he was sorely punished for the theft of divine fire, he was later venerated as a benefactor to mankind. You like to think of the gift of fire as something like the gift of magic by bringing it to humanity. Prometheus gave you the power to create change in the world, to warm your homes, to light the darkness, to prepare food, and, yes, to make potions. As a breeze ripples the stalks, releasing more of their tantalizing scent across the trickle of water, you can almost hear the fennel whispering to you. Magic is everywhere, seen and unseen. Continuing your search, you come to wonder how far you've wandered into the forest. You have something of an answer moments later when you glimpse a shining curtain of light straight ahead. You draw closer to it, watching the way strands of light, like a luminous tapestry, twist between the trees, like a net floating in gentle waves of water. This you suppose, is the enchanted barrier drawn by the professor for your protection. Beyond it, the expanse of forest is vague, blurry, and inaccessible. You wonder what manner of wonders lie in the darkness beyond that shimmering veil. Returning to the task at hand, you refer again to the text to assess your outstanding ingredients. There are only three left now. You trudge through a thick blanket of fallen leaves, which litter the damp earth of the deciduous groves. They're not all fallen just yet but those that lie are turning to compost underfoot, feeding the soil and the plants that grow here. You come to the edge of a pool in which glitter the reflections of tree branches that bend together overhead and the handful of stars that peek through their twigs. There's another bouncing orb of light moving toward you from the opposite direction. As it comes closer, 
you can make out the features of a friend in its wake. The first time you've seen another student since stepping into the wood. You acknowledge each other across the pool. It's Charlotte, the star student of your year. How are you making out, you ask, your voice louder than you expect it to be as it cuts through the silence and over the pool. Oh, quite well, she responds. I've only one left to find, and it seems I've just found it. Here she moves her lit wand upward to indicate a tree near you. She begins to edge around the pool toward it. Wild apple, she says. You hadn't noticed it before, but there, steps from where you stand, is a twisted tree laden with heavy, ripe fruits. Charlotte reaches up with one hand to twist a single fruit from the branch and regard it thoughtfully. The simple gesture which you repeat on your side of the tree resonates with powerful symbolism. The apple has meant so much throughout the course of human history, myth and medicine. The fruit of knowledge, the golden boon for heroes like Hercules, the gift bestowed on goddesses to launch legendary conflicts. It's a fruit of love, a delicacy, and a health-heartening favorite the whole world over. Such a fruit certainly belongs in a healing potion. Before Charlotte retreats, you ask her, how did you find everything so quickly? She gives a characteristic sigh and replies, With a locator spell, of course. Simply speak the incantation and substitute the Latin name for each herb. It leads you right to the closest occurrence. With that, she turns and disappears with her wand light, back into the forest. A locator spell. Why hadn't you thought of that, you wonder? But then, doesn't that seem all too easy? Using spells to find the ingredients is fine for those who choose that path. But for you, there's value in the search. The intuition, the connection with all the intricacies of the forest and the ways in which the many plants and trees coexist, sharing resources, contributing to the thriving of the ecosystem. That relationship of the plants in the shared environment is similar in a way to the relationship of ingredients in a potion. It's as if the forest, throughout your search, has been teaching you the recipe so that when you at last come to brew the potion, it will be written in your very heart. You've no doubt that Charlotte's attempt that the nine herbs charm will be excellent, precise, and well received. But what was it Professor Bain said? All potions are poems. Your potion, you firmly believe, will be like poetry. Depositing the blush-cheeked apple into your bag of herbs, now nearly full, you set your mind about discovering the final two ingredients. 
both are ground foliage. So you turn your wand light to the forest floor again, searching the perimeter of the pool before moving on into the wood. Before long, you come to a wild flowering patch of stinging nettle, leaves spined with little hair-like points, which you know will sting to the touch. It's quite the challenge to forage for such a plant. Any contact with the skin will produce a reaction, and now you regret not having worn gardening gloves. But come now, you think. You know magic. Surely there's something you can do to make the task more palatable. There are broadleaf dock plants growing nearby, which often occur alongside nettle and can be a powerful remedy for stings. You pluck a few dock leaves and rub them between your fingers to stimulate the oil. For good measure, you then point your wand at the bundle of leaves, speaking the incantation for an amplification charm, which should enhance the plant's protective abilities. You know the spell has worked, when the leaves begin to dimly glow. You rub them once more over your fingers and palms, instantly feeling a cool, numbing sensation across your hands. Now you're ready. You bend to gather leaves of nettle, breathing a sigh of relief to know that your charm has worked perfectly. Instead of stings, there's only a light tingle against your fingers. Picking the nettle this way reminds you of an old story. A fairy tale, wasn't it? About a young woman whose brothers were all turned to birds. Swans. And the only way to return them to their human form was to weave them shirts of stinging nettle, despite how the plant stung her hands. Yet from such a fiery leaf comes great medicinal power. Nettle is anti-inflammatory, reduces muscle pain, and relieves stress. It seems as if the nettle speaks to you. Look beyond the expected to find the true source of magic. Now, there is only one more herb to be harvested. The first one listed in the charm and hailed as the oldest of herbs, mugwort, known to you as Artemisia vulgaris named so after Artemis, the Greek goddess of the hunt. Some myths held that Artemis was born from a mugwort plant. You can almost hear her footsteps in the untroubled silence of night, dashing through the forest with her companions, the deer, you wonder if you can hear the voice of Artemisia in the same way, just as you've heard the nascent whispers of the other plants on your herbal path. You close your eyes and listen tenderly to the song of the forest, searching inwardly for the strain of mugwort's magic your lips settle into a dreamy smile when you begin to understand and you find yourself almost laughing. How funny, you think. She was here all along. 
It's true. On every step of your journey tonight, Silver green leaves of delicate foliage have crept their way into the patches of plantain, fennel, and shrivel. You've had your hands in it, even, while harvesting the other ingredients, and never noticed. That's a wonderful property of mugwort, you suppose, that it can grow anywhere. It winds its way through a life, often unnoticed, spinning its magic threads. Even now, it springs up at your feet. You follow spare patches of it several paces, as if you're tracking the footsteps of its goddess namesake, until you come to a sprawling blanket of it at the feet of an ancient yew tree. Her fragrance is potent, sending your mind to sway. Hypnotic, how the spaces betwixt her lace leaves catch starlight, how the moon is in her face. I would know you anywhere, she seems to say fluttering and flashing the silver underbelly of her green leaves. You're tempted to step into the mugwort meadow and lie down, curl up in her softness, and drift to sleep. It would be fitting. This plant is also called dreamwort and is used in spell work for elucidating messages from dreams. It's a plant of clarity, intuition, and prophecy. Oldest of words, and most exalted of all the ingredients in the Nine Herbs charm. With a loving hand, you cut sprigs of the soft foliage completing your collection at last. With all nine herbs in hand, you are almost sorry to leave the forest. What a tranquil and restorative evening you've had among the trees and plants. But there's a potion, a poem to be brewed at the wood's edge so you must depart. You think you know the way back, but just in case, with a flick of your wand, you conjure a sparkling trail that maps the distance you've already traveled, magically retracing your footsteps. To your delight, though you hadn't known it, The path makes a winding helix, a sacred spiral through this section of the wood. On your way back, much quicker than the way in, you say goodnight to the trees and the sleeping birds. At length, you emerge. Only a few cauldrons are set to simmer already the glow of embers red in the darkening night. Atop the hill the castle sits in silhouette, its windows flickering, suggestive of grand fireplaces lit in the dormitories. You move to your cauldron and turn out the leather bag upon the table. There are all nine plants, fruits and leaves and flowers. Professor Bain happens by, counts the ingredients, and gives you a nod to indicate that you've chosen well. With a wave of your wand and a low incantation, you send forth a spark of fire to light the wood beneath your cauldron. 
As the water heats, you prepare your herbs. Some you crush with mortar and pestle, releasing plumes of fragrance upon the night. Others you cut carefully with a ceremonial knife. The apple you peel in one long corkscrew piece, hoping the pigment lends a pleasing hue to the potion. And when the water begins to simmer, you thoughtfully cast ingredients into its belly. With each casting, you consider the layers of meaning and magic in the plants, the messages they whisper to you in the wood. The steam rises, aromatic and potent, bewitching your senses. You take great care to stir only when needed, to allow herbs to steep well before adding others, and to infuse your task with sincere intention, the root of all magic. As you work, more students stumble out of the woods with overflowing satchels or armfuls of plants. Some have nettle stings on their hands, which Professor Bain sets right with a salve she carries. Soon enough, a student is working at every cauldron. Nine potion makers brewing in the night under the light of the moon. A potion is a poem, you think. This potion is a dream. The recipe is written in your heart, derived from a ritual walk through the wood, a communion with the plants you now toss into the cauldron, incensed with apple peel and fennel seed, deepened with betony and plantain, lifted with chervil and lamb's grass, stung through with nettle, softened with chamomile, and lastly, spellbound with mugwort, the dreamer's plant. It's a potion to heal, certainly, but you intend it most as a potion for sleep, mugwort taking the lead within the mixture, a gentle agent to restore the mind and body through dreams. Eight clockwise stirs and one witter shins to set the potion. The number nine, of course, is strong and magic. On the final stir, a veil of sheer gold settles over the top of the potion. It might be invisible if it weren't for the mild light of the waning moon. It's done. As if she senses its completion, Professor Bain appears only a moment later and peers over the brim of your cauldron. She inhales the trails of steam. There's a deep aroma of licorice, spice, and candied apple. With a graceful hand, she ladles a portion into a small glass vial and holds it up to the light of the moon. The liquid sparkles, a deep green color with a halcyon iridescence. She puts a stopper in the bottle and with the tip of her wand inscribes your initials into the cork as if etching them with fire. This she stashes in a basket with two other 
similar vessels. When you're ready, she says in a hushed tone, you're dismissed. You can take some with you if you like. It's only now that you realize two of your classmates have left their cauldrons, finished with the exam, and already back up at the castle by now. Before she leaves to inspect the work of others, your certain Professor Bain gives you a wink. She must have liked the look of your potion. You'll know soon enough when you get your marks. Feeling accomplished, and also, suddenly, immeasurably weary, you do decide to take some of the potion with you. With a steady hand, you pour a ladle full into one of the glass bottles provided, stopping it with a cork. Then, with a flourish, you extinguish the fire beneath your cauldron, leave the textbook on the table, and depart. Halfway up the rocky side of the hill, you stop and turn back to look at the forest and the threshold of cauldrons and smoldering fires before it. From here you can almost see, or is it an illusion, cast by the scudding of night clouds across the moon, the shifting, shimmering barrier, delineating the protected space of the wood. In the caretaker's cottage, a light in the window blinks out, and a few final wisps of smoke escape the chimney. You climb the rest of the way up to the castle. As you push open the heavy doors to the entrance hall, you're greeted with a curtain of warmth. Your chilled fingers and toes quickly soften and tingle, and a dreamy haze settles over your eyes. Surely it's not very late, but you're simply overcome with the desire to go straight to your bed and surrender to a long and fathomless sleep. If only you could wave your wand and be there now, instantly. But with your mind and gaze soft, you climb the many stairs to the tower that is your dormitory. In the common space, a few students are gathered to study for their exams before the blazing fireplace. They greet you cheerily, asking if you'd like to join them. But you wave nonchalantly, and explain that you're off to bed. Once within your room, you think that nothing has ever looked so inviting as your mattress at this moment. The plush pillows and thick blankets, the brocade curtains that drape from the canopy, you're ready to fall into the softness of it the moment you enter. But you stop to steal the briefest glance out the nearby window. The gleam of lit cauldron fire still pulses below, and the waning crescent moon glitters in reflection across the lake. Settling at last, with a sigh, into your bed, you draw the glass bottle from the pocket of your robes. Even now, the potion within shimmers. You unstopper it, take a deep inhale, 
and immediately feel waves of relaxation cascade over your body from head to toe. This potion is for dreamers, you think. And without hesitation, you take a small sip savoring the autumnal blend of flavors of the elixir. It's a potion for healing through sleep. And with heavy eyelids, you settle back between the blankets, drawing closed the curtains around your bed. You slip sweetly into sleep, like an ice cube melting in a glass of warm water. Mugwort takes your hand and leads you into the labyrinth of dreams. <laughs>